Good evening. Welcome to the LSE. Um, my first task is uh, to see if the microphones work and the people in the back are awake. So at the back, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so both those are confirmed. The, um, there is a Twitter hashtag for this event, which is hash LSE, capital B, small o, capital E. You don't have to guess what that stands for. Um, it's a great personal pleasure for me today to welcome a good friend of mine and a, and a good friend of the LSE, indeed a, a great uh, figure in the LSE, Charlie Bean. Um, he's going to give his valedictory lecture in the sense that it is the last uh, public lecture he will give as Deputy Governor of the Bank of England. He's been Deputy Governor since uh, 2008. He completes his term at the end of June. He is a visiting professor at the LSE, and uh, we are indeed hoping to see even more of him uh, after his departure from uh, the bank. It's a valedictory lecture, and it is a valedictory lecture, quite appropriately, about the future, the future of monetary policy. Now, uh, I won't say very much about uh, Charlie's background. Most of you will know him in any case. But he did um, a PhD at MIT under the great um, economist and teacher, uh, Bob Solo, something I shared with uh, Charlie. Uh, which was being a student of Bob Solo, and as well as being a wonderful teacher of economics, Bob Solo um, was absolutely outstanding amongst economists, indeed amongst people, of knowing how to behave and to carry himself. And uh, those of you who want to know what being a decent human being is, will study with Bob Solo. And it, Charlie, if you'll forgive me, I think it is actually clear the way you carry yourself and behave to others that you are indeed a student of Bob Solo's. Charlie uh, was a professor here at the LSE. Indeed, we were colleagues here at the LSE in the late 80s and uh, 1990s. And then the call came from another former uh, professor of economics at the LSE, uh, Mervyn King, to come and be chief economist of the Bank of England. So Charlie was chief economist of the Bank of England from uh, 2000 and then became deputy governor of the Bank of England in 2008 and has been on the Monetary Policy Committee uh, throughout those 13 years. So it's a special pleasure for us to welcome um, Charlie back to the LSE. It's a, an honor that you've chosen to give your valedictory lecture here at the school, and we're looking forward to your lecture tonight, and indeed looking forward uh, very much to seeing more of you. Welcome, Charlie. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nick, for those uh, kind words. As um, uh, Nick's already said, I left the LSE to become the Bank of England's uh, chief economist and a member of um, its, at that stage, fledgling Monetary Policy Committee almost 14 years ago. Uh, by the time I finish, I'll have done 166 Monetary Policy Committee meetings. Uh, the bank had not long been given the responsibility for determining interest rates, uh, but had at the same time relinquished the responsibility for banking supervision. Uh, now, as I approach the end of my tenure there, the bank looks rather different. Banking supervision has returned, and a new policy committee, the Financial Policy Committee, which I also sit on, has been charged with preserving the stability of the financial system. Uh, now, as I look back, I think it's fair to say that it's been a, a pretty extraordinary, indeed unique, period to be involved in economic policy. My first seven years were years of plenty. Now, let's see if I can get my slide up. Okay. Uh, my first seven years were years of plenty. Growth was steady, unemployment was low, and inflation never strayed very far from the target. From time to time, the MPC nudged bank rate 
up or down a quarter point, and the economy obediently stayed on course. Now, to economists, this period of unusual macroeconomic tranquility and the years uh, leading up to it are referred to as the Great Moderation. But as you can see from this chart, the second seven years were years of famine as the Great Moderation turned into a Great Tribulation. The worst financial crisis for a century, the most prolonged downturn on record, and inflation that rose above 5%. The MPC slash bank rate, as low as it's ever been in the bank's 320 year history. To bolster demand further, we then injected new money worth around a quarter of annual GDP through asset purchases. But despite the massive dosage, output is only now approaching its previous peak. Well, this evening, I'll reflect on some of the innovations in monetary policy that took place as a result of the crisis, and then I'll go on to look at some of the broader changes in the framework that it's prompted. Well, dealing with the crisis led central banks to innovate in several ways. In the first instance, this involved lending at longer tenors against a wider range of collateral and to a wider range of counterparties in order to keep financial markets functioning. For our part, as well as offering longer-term funding through our repo operations, we also introduced the Special Liquidity Scheme, enabling banks to borrow treasury bills, which are relatively liquid, against their illiquid mortgage-backed securities. And then later, we introduced the Funding for Lending Scheme, providing banks with cheap funding and a financial incentive to expand lending. Well, some of these facilities have since been made a permanent feature of our sterling monetary framework, and others, such as the Special Liquidity Scheme and the Funding for Lending Scheme, are by their nature temporary. More noteworthy from a monetary policy perspective, though, was the use of unconventional tools to inject further stimulus when policy rates approach their zero lower bound. And that took the form of explicit guidance to depress expectations of future interest rates and large-scale asset uh, purchases financed by the issuance of reserves, what's colloquially known as quantitative easing. Well, let me start with forward guidance, which has particularly attracted academic interest. By holding rates lower for longer, the central bank can implement an optimal, yet time inconsistent, path for rates that boost demand today by lowering future nominal interest rates and by raising future inflation. It's time inconsistent because when the future comes, it will no longer seem appropriate to go through with the promised inflationary episode. Because policy committees cannot tie the hands of their successors, I don't believe that such time inconsistent strategies can be implemented credibly other than over rather short time horizons. Of course, all central banks provide guidance regarding the economic outlook and the factors determining policy so as to influence expectations. Several central banks such as the Reserve Bank of New Zealand and the Swedish Riksbank, go as far as providing forecasts of their own future policy decisions. Well, until last August, uh, the Monetary Policy Committee had shied away from providing such explicit guidance, lest it be misinterpreted as a promise that was independent of the state of the economy. Instead, we preferred to provide an implicit steer through the medium of the projections contained in our quarterly inflation report. Last August, however, the MPC decided that more explicit guidance about our reaction function could be helpful. Rather than aiming to provide more stimulus, as in the academic literature, we were merely seeking to ensure that the recovery was not nipped in the bud by a premature rise in market interest rates, 
despite there still being a significant margin of economic slack. We said then that we would not even countenance a rise in bank rate until unemployment had fallen to 7%, subject to overrides relating to excessive upward movements in inflation expectations and to the risk to financial stability, with the latter being policed by the Financial Policy Committee. Now, we chose unemployment in part because its behaviour is directly linked to one of the key uncertainties at the current juncture, uh, namely the scope for recovery and productivity. And as this chart shows, it's been unusually weak since the onset of the crisis, and that's been for reasons we don't yet fully understand. Uh, so the dashed line here uh, gives you a picture of what would happen if it had kept on growing its pre-crisis trend, and as you can see, it's actually been pretty flat since the onset of the crisis. Uh, now, if productivity rebounds as the economy picks up, uh, then unemployment would fall relatively slowly. But in that case, there would also be more scope to maintain an expansionary policy before inflationary pressures began to rise. The opposite holds if productivity growth remains weak, unemployment falls more quickly, but we would then also need to begin raising bank rate earlier. So the linkage to unemployment of the, uh, the guidance that we issued last August has the right relationship uh, to um, uh, the state of the economy. Shorter term market interest rates have moved higher since guidance was introduced, but no more so than is justified by a string of unexpectedly strong activity indicators. And there is persuasive survey evidence that businesses have both understood the message. Uh, so this shows the results from a couple of surveys, one carried out by uh, the uh, uh, market um, uh, 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 research and financial services firm, survey of companies. Uh, the bank also has a, a network of regional agencies. They have about 8,000 business uh, contacts around the country, and they sampled a, a subset of those uh, with basically the same questions as being asked in the uh, market survey. Uh, the question was, which of the following best describes how the bank's policy guidance has changed your view of when bank rate will next change? Uh, and as you can see, um, about half said that uh, it had persuaded them that, if anything, rates would stay lower for uh, longer than they previously thought, uh, another good chunk um, uh, suggesting uh, uh, no change. But some uh, positive signals there from uh, that question. Uh, the same surveys also asked the business contacts uh, how the guidance would affect their uh, decisions. Um, so would it make them more likely to bring forward capital spending, increase investment spending, take on more staff, so forth. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, there's some evidence that it uh, also made businesses more prepared to hire and invest. Uh, well, in the event, unemployment fell rather faster than we expected, reaching the 7% threshold in the data release for the three months to February. In anticipation of that, in our February inflation report, we provided further guidance, not only on the conditions that would lead the committee to begin tightening, but also the likely trajectory thereafter. Well, regarding the first question, while unemployment provides a useful conditioning variable for not tightening, the question of when to tighten needs to take account of other margins of slack as well. And these can arise in both the labor market for instance, discouraged workers who have temporarily left the labor force uh, and those who are underemployed, uh, and also slack that uh, is uh, inside firms, underutilized labor. The amount of slack in an economy is necessarily uh, a fuzzy concept. Um, you're, those of you who are students here will know from your lectures that your lecturers gaily talk about potential output and output gaps and things like that. 
as though uh, potential output and output gaps can be precisely measured. Uh, the problem is that uh, potential output can't be observed and can be inferred only indirectly. Uh, so it's a fuzzy concept. Nevertheless, given the transmission lags, monetary policymakers can't avoid forming a judgment about the level of activity that's consistent with inflation sustainably remaining at target and thus of the margin of economic slack. Now, our central view is that the margin of slack in the UK economy is presently around 1 to 1.5% 1 of GDP, though I should stress the considerable degree of uncertainty around that estimate. And I should also stress that that's a short-run concept relevant to inflationary pressures a year or so ahead and doesn't incorporate any endogenous improvement in productivity that may materialise in the wake of faster growth over a longer horizon. Uh, and we've said that we're aiming to close that gap over the next two or three years while keeping inflation close to our 2% target. We've also said that when bank rate does rise, it's likely to do so only gradually and to a level that's likely to remain materially below its pre-crisis average of 5% for some while. And that reflects the continuing headwinds from public and private deleveraging and continued weak growth in the euro area, continued downward pressure on global interest rates from high Chinese net savings, and the undue compression of risk premia during the run-up to the crisis, uh, which is unlikely to be uh, sustained in the future. Uh, let me now turn to asset purchases, uh, preferred tool for adding stimulus when bank rate uh, reached its effective lower bound. Under this program, the bank acquired 375 billion of longer term UK government debt, and that's equivalent to around 25% of annual GDP. Uh, and that comprised 200 billion purchased between March 2009 and February 2010, the early stages of the recession. Uh, and then another 175 billion acquired between October 2011 and November 2012 uh, during the worst of the Eurozone crisis. By depressing the term premium on gilts, the purchases lowered the long-term safe rate of interest, and such purchases also led to lower spreads on risky assets as investors rebalanced their portfolios. In addition, the extra liquidity in the banking system may have helped boost credit supply. Finally, such purchases may also have reinforced market perceptions that policy would remain loose for an extended period uh, what's sometimes referred to as the signaling channel. Well, analysis carried out by bank staff suggests that the first phase of our asset purchases lowered long rates by around a percentage point. Uh, and there's other studies out there that find correspondingly similar impacts uh, from the Federal Reserve's uh, large-scale asset purchases. The impact of the second round of our purchases is harder to isolate because some of the effect was probably already priced into the market when the program was reactivated. Uh, but there are good reasons anyway to believe the impact was smaller because markets were less dysfunctional than after the collapse of Lehman Brothers. There's also considerable uncertainty about the impact uh, of those asset purchases onto growth and inflation, but our present central assessment is that the program had a peak impact on GDP of around 2.5% and raised inflation by a little more than one percentage point. Well, since the evidence suggests that asset purchases lower longer term rates and stimulate demand, should they be a permanent part of the central bank's armory or should they be reserved for emergencies? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons why they should be seen as just an emergency weapon for use when policy rates reach the effective lower bound. First, we have less of a handle on their impact than we do changes in short-term policy rates. And as I just indicated, that impact may well be less when markets are functioning normally. 
Second, if the central bank routinely deals in large quantities of government debt, it may find itself more open to pressure from the fiscal authorities, while market participants are more likely to fear that the debt will be permanently monetized. Now that brings me naturally to the topic of unwinding our present large stock of asset uh, purchases. We've committed to maintaining the stock, including reinvesting the cash flows associated with maturing gilts, at least until the first rise in bank rate. But at some stage thereafter, as part of the transition back to, to normality, we expect to start running down the portfolio and withdrawing the associated bank reserves. Well, now, in principle, we could do this just by letting the gilts mature. Uh, however, as chart five demonstrates, it would take a long time to run off organically in its entirety, uh, something like 2065. Uh, that's because of the relatively long average maturity of the gilts that we hold. The weighted average maturity of our portfolio is uh, more than 12 years. So more active sales uh, may be called for at some stage, uh, though the MPC would be unlikely to initiate such a program until bank rate was high enough that it could be cut to maintain demand if conditions deteriorated. Such a program of sales could be expected to put upward pressure on yields, though by much less than the purchases pushed down on yields uh, when they were uh, initiated, because markets would be functioning more normally. In addition, both heightened risk aversion and regulatory changes mean the banks will want to hold significantly more high-quality liquid assets than in the past. Uh, my next chart just uh, shows the extent to which uh, they'd uh, run down their liquid assets uh, relative to their, uh, the total size uh, of their balance sheets uh, in the, uh, the years running up to the crisis. So if you go back into the 60s, depending on exactly which measure you look at, um, the ratio of liquid assets to total assets, 10% uh, for the narrowest measure, a broader uh, measure, uh, about 25%, shrunk to about 1% uh, on the eve of the, uh, the crisis. Uh, it's risen uh, subsequently in part uh, reflecting our asset purchases and the extra reserves uh, that have been uh, injected. Uh, these, the heightened risk aversion and regulatory changes, as I say, to together mean that the banks are likely to want to continue to hold more liquid assets than they did pre-crisis. And that means an additional source of demand for gilts uh, and similar assets that can be easily sold uh, or um, borrowed against in the markets. Uh, and that should also attenuate the upward pressure on yields from us running down our asset purchase portfolio. Now, in case this all sounds rather sanguine, I should say that I don't expect central banks' collective management of the exit from the present exceptionally stimulatory monetary stance is going to be easy. The bumpiness of the incoming data, allied to state contingent policy reaction functions, means that market interest rates are bound to become more volatile along the exit path however well central banks communicate their intentions. Now, we've already seen the sensitivity of markets to changes in the expected part of US monetary policy during the so-called taper tantrum last spring, and its attendant consequences for other countries, uh, especially, but not exclusively, uh, in the emerging economies. Movements in yield curves have been strongly correlated across countries not only at the long end, which isn't all that surprising, but also at the short end of the curve, where domestic monetary policy considerations ought to be dominant. Another reason the exit may be bumpy stems from the starting point. Implied volatilities in many financial markets, so this is uh, a measure of uh, the uncertainty about asset prices derived from <coughs> options prices, uh, they've actually been at historically quite low levels for some time now. This is illustrated in the, uh, 
this spider chart. Um, the, uh, so you've got uh, a number of different financial uh, asset prices here, uh, the FTSE 100, S&P 500, so stock prices there, sterling dollar exchange rate at the top, uh, an emerging market foreign currency index, then uh, longer term interest rates and shorter term interest rates for uh, US and UK. Um, you should think of naught on uh, each of these axes as corresponding to the average volatility uh, over the period 2003 uh, up to the, the present. Um, in the period uh, before the crisis, uh, on average, uh, these volatilities were as given by that blue line. Uh, it, they blew out uh, during the crisis and, and the immediate aftermath with a lot of uncertainty. Uh, but the interesting thing is, uh, over recent months, uh, implied volatility is this assess assessment in financial markets of the uncertainty uh, associated with asset price movements has come back to being very compressed again, that uh, green line in the centre uh, of the picture. Uh, well, together with low safe interest rates in the advanced economies, uh, this has underpinned a new, uh, renewed search for yield uh, together with carry trades. And taken in isolation, this is eerily reminiscent of what happened in the run-up to the crisis. So episodes like the taper tantrum of last spring, which produced a short-lived bout of volatility in financial markets, but no major disruption, may also be contributing to a sense of complacency and an underestimation of market risk by investors. Now, it's inevitable that at some stage, market perceptions of uncertainty will revert to more normal levels. And that's likely to be associated with falls in risky asset prices. Uh, and this could be prompted by uh, a range of factors. It might be adverse developments in the Ukraine, uh, fault lines in the Chinese financial sector being exposed, monetary policy exit in the advanced economies, or something else. Uh, but I think almost surely uh, at some stage there will be uh, an increase in uh, these implied volatilities and the perceptions of the riskiness of the environment. So the bottom line is that we may yet encounter a few potholes on the way uh, to the exit. But the good thing is that banks are better capitalised now than in the run into the crisis. Leverage is lower. There's better visibility of counterparty exposures and we're better placed to deal with financial institutions that get into trouble. So the risk of major financial problems uh, crystallizing in the advanced economies should be much lower. Those emerging economies that have financed large external deficits through the accumulation of foreign currency debt uh, may be more vulnerable, though. Well, let me turn now to the impact of the crisis on the monetary policy framework itself. Before the crisis, the conventional wisdom in central banks was that monetary and financial stability were largely complementary in nature. The maintenance of price stability would help foster stable macroeconomic conditions uh, by anchoring expectations. And the consequent reduction in macroeconomic volatility should help reduce the likelihood of episodes of financial instability. All that was necessary was for banking supervisors to ensure that individual financial institutions followed responsible lending policies and all would be well. Well, today, there's a tendency to claim that the crisis revealed a fatal flaw in focusing on price stability as the primary object of monetary policy namely a failure to recognize that it could, in some circumstances, actually be detrimental to financial stability. While the years before the crisis were characterized by stability in the evolution of the market for goods and services, asset markets were anything but stable. In particular, there was a massive expansion in credit, particularly within the financial system in many of the advanced economies, accompanied by upward pressure on a range of asset prices, including uh, those of real estate. 
There was a boom in asset markets, even if there was no corresponding boom in the real economy. To some people, the relatively low level of interest rates necessary to maintain price stability was instrumental in generating this boom in credit and asset prices by encouraging an aggressive search for yield. Now, while there's some truth in this charge, I think it would be a mistake to conclude that monetary policy was the sole or even the prime cause of the crisis. Several factors coincided to form a potent cocktail. There were other factors that depressed the yield on safe assets, including high savings rates in China and a more general demand for US treasuries as emerging economies accumulated larger stocks of foreign reserves in the wake of the Asia crisis. Equally important, in my view, was the impact of the great moderation itself on risk-taking behavior, as low volatility encouraged an underestimation of the likelihood and severity of adverse tail risks crystallizing. Seen in this light, the great moderation sowed the seeds of its own destruction. On top of this, of course, there was a litany of microeconomic features that aggravated the crisis, including the development of complex securities that were impossible to value in stress conditions and connected financial institutions in unexpected ways, disguised leverage through the use of securitization vehicles whose primary aim was regulatory arbitrage, remuneration packages encouraging positions that generated decent returns most of the time but high losses in some states of the world, excessive reliance on credit rating agencies, defective risk management, weak funding structures, and insufficient high-quality bank capital to absorb losses. That said, the experience of the past few years does appear to suggest that monetary policy ought to take greater account of financial stability concerns. Ahead of the crisis, uh, Bill White, together with some of his colleagues at the Bank for International Settlements, consistently argued that when leverage was becoming excessive or asset prices misaligned, central bankers ought to lean against the wind by keeping interest rates higher than necessary to meet the price stability objective in the short run. Just as central banks are willing to accept temporary deviations from their inflation targets to limit output volatility, so they should also be willing to accept temporary deviations to attenuate a dangerous credit cycle. Essentially, it is worth accepting a little more volatility in output and inflation in the short run if one can thereby reduce the size or frequency of asset price busts and credit crunches uh, with their attendant adverse uh, impact on activity further down the road. Such a view, I should say, ran counter to that espoused by many central bankers, uh, most notably the Federal Reserve Chairman Alan Greenspan, who questioned the feasibility of addressing such financial imbalances with preemptive monetary policy. In his view, monetary policy should instead focus on minimizing the fallout from any subsequent correction, and this is sometimes called the cleaning approach as opposed to the leaning against the wind approach. Uh, well, while the logic of leaning against the wind is sound in principle, the key question is whether a monetary tightening of plausible magnitude is likely to be effective in, att in attenuating an established credit boom. Even if policy rates may appear with hindsight to have been held too low for too long in the years preceding the crisis, particularly in the United States, the empirical evidence suggests they would need to have been significantly higher to have had a meaningful impact on the rate of credit expansion. It's a brave central banker who would deliberately induce a recession in order to head off the mere risk of a future financial correction. And that explains the interest in deploying additional policy instruments that are better suited to restraining the buildup of dangerous financial imbalances and contributing to the maintenance of financial stability, so-called macroprudential tools. With two targets, price and financial stability,
one really wants another instrument or set of instruments to complement monetary policy. And in the new arrangements that were established following the crisis, the deployment of such instruments falls to the bank's financial policy committee. Well, there's several potential macroprudential tools to deal with such cyclical risks, but they can be broadly classified into two types. Those that increase the resilience of the system and those that work preemptively against a buildup of leverage. Uh, and in addition, measures may be targeted or more general in their impact. So just to give you some examples, first consider the counter-cyclical buffer that's been introduced uh, under the new Basel III arrangements uh, and implemented in the European Union under the Capital Requirements Directive. By forcing banks to hold extra high-quality loss-absorbing capacity during a credit boom that can be released during a subsequent downturn, this primarily improves resilience. But because it raises the marginal cost of bank funds, the counter-cyclical capital buffer should also in inhibit the build-up of leverage in the first place. And there's several reasons why debt finance is cheaper than equity finance, including the implicit subsidy from being too big to fail and the advantageous tax treatment of debt. Moreover, debt pays the same return in all states of the world, except when default takes place, while the return on equity will vary, and that makes debt more attractive for some investors, especially during financial booms, when the probability of default is perceived to be low. Raising the capital requirements on particular components of banks' balance sheets by varying sectoral risk weights is different in that it alters the relative attractiveness of different sorts of lending. Assuming that the increase in capital requirements is targeted at those sectors where the risks are most material, then not only is resilience increased, but it also encourages substitution towards safer forms of lending, and thus has a preemptive character. And then finally, there are tools that directly target borrowing, such as loan to income or loan to value caps for mortgages, and restrictions on the share of banks' portfolios that can be allocated to high loan-to-income or loan-to-value lending, uh, as recently introduced by the Reserve Bank of New Zealand. By acting directly on the riskiest segments of lending, such tools are more obviously preemptive in nature. Importantly, when monetary policy, uh, while monetary policy is well suited to dealing with the problems that arise from sluggish wage and price adjustment, a good macroprudential tool will be one that's well targeted at dealing with the particular financial market failure, such as the underestimation of risk. Well, to see in a highly stylized way how monetary and macroprudential tools can be combined, as well as the appropriate instrument assignment, uh, consider first the following uh, chart. Uh, the left-hand panel is relatively conventional and portrays the market for goods and services. So IS is an aggregate demand schedule, with demand a decreasing function of both the policy rate, uh, which I'm going to call R, uh, and a macroprudential instrument. I'm not going to be specific about what it is, but let's call it K. And the higher is K, uh, the more restraining effect that has on lending. So PC here is an expectations augmented Phillips curve. Uh, where I've assumed that inflation expectations are anchored at the inflation target, pi star. Uh, for any given set of shocks to aggregate demand and supply, the inflation target can be achieved by the set of pairs of R and K along the downward sloping schedule PS in the right-hand diagram. PS here stands for price stability. It's a price stability schedule. An increase in demand resulting from, say, an increase in the propensity to invest would shift this schedule out to the right. Turn now to the credit market. Conventional macroeconomic analyses of the market for loanable funds tend to focus on the flow of funds from saving households to businesses undertaking capital expenditures. But as my next chart makes clear, uh, such lending constitutes only a small fraction of the assets held by UK banks. Uh, so th this shows the asset side of the aggregated 
uh, UK, uh, the aggregated balance sheet of UK uh, banks. Um, so it's a bit over two and a half uh, trillion pounds in size. Um, uh, loans to businesses for investing in machines, capital equipment, uh, is that sort of dark green bit in the middle. Uh, the light blue bit at the model uh, at the bottom is mortgages uh, to households. So that's uh, um, a pretty big chunk, uh, more than a, uh, a third, getting on for a half of the um, uh, the balance sheet. And then you've got other components such as lending for commercial real estate, uh, um, lending to financial businesses, which is the uh, orange bit, holdings of securities, and so forth. But lending to companies for investment despite the fact that's what uh, a lot of the academic models focus on, is actually a tiny bit of what's uh, going on here. Uh, instead, the vast majority of loans are provided to finance the acquisition of existing assets, especially real estate. Uh, and this should be borne in mind when contemplating the factors behind the demand and supply of credit, which are shown in the left-hand panel of the next chart, as uh, CD, demand for credit, and CS, supply of credit, respectively. Uh, demand decreases with the cost of borrowing, which I'm calling RB, uh, and supply increases with the return on bank debt, which would include deposits, uh, which I'm going to call RD. Uh, and for simplicity, let's think of RD as moving in line with the policy rate R that I had in the previous chart or previous chart but one. Uh, now, I've uh, shown here also a spread between the borrowing rate uh, and the uh, deposit or debt rate, and that reflects expectations of default, not only by the end borrowers, but also by the financial intermediary. In credit booms, this spread is often unsustainably compressed, while during credit crunches, it widens sharply. Now, our macroprudential instrument, K, is assumed either to reduce the demand for credit or to increase the spread between the borrowing rate uh, and the deposit rate, the debt rate, uh, or both of those things. Either way, it'll end up reducing the total quantity of credit, uh, denoted C in the diagram. Now, unlike macroeconomic stability, which can be characterized as output being at its sustainable level once nominal wages and prices have adjusted and inflation is at target, there's no corresponding simple characterization of financial stability. But for simplicity, let me assume that the authorities have in mind some maximum level of leverage that's consistent with the risk to future financial stability remaining acceptable. Then we get the downward sloping frontier FS, which stands for financial stability, in the right-hand panel that shows the minimum acceptable level of the policy rate for, every, for any given setting of the macroprudential tool. A reduction in perceived risk leading to excessive exuberance on the part of investors or borrowers would shift this frontier to the right. So putting these two policy relationships, PS and FS, together, uh, we get the following chart. The respective slopes of the two schedules depend on the relative impact of the policy rate and the macroprudential tool on aggregate demand and on the quantity of credit. A well-chosen and well-designed macroprudential tool is one that has a relatively large effect on the quantity of credit but only a modest impact on aggregate demand. And that would generate a relatively flat FS schedule in this picture. Moreover, since changes in policy rates also affect aggregate demand through routes other than the credit channel, such as the exchange rate, it seems reasonable to assume that the uh, price stability schedule, PS, is relatively steep. And that's the uh, configuration of relative slopes that I've shown in this chart with the uh, financial stability uh, frontier being flatter than the price stability schedule. So provided the two schedules don't coincide, both price and financial stability objectives can be achieved simultaneously. Well, with this configuration, it's natural to assign the monetary instrument to the pursuit of price stability 
and the macroprudential instrument to the pursuit of financial stability. Moreover, with these slopes and this assignment, no active coordination in the setting of the instruments is strictly necessary, a process where each instrument is set independently, taking the other as given, uh, would uh, lead us to converge on the equilibrium A. That said, appropriate coordination and information exchange is clearly desirable uh, to achieve a point like A in the most efficient fashion. And it's facilitated in the real world by housing the Monetary Policy Committee and the Financial Policy Committee uh, in the same building, with overlapping memberships and the scope to meet jointly when required. Well, some sorts of shocks are going to require a tightening in both instruments. For instance, consider a bout of irrational exuberance on the part of households, businesses, and investors. The increased optimism is associated with an increase in the demand for goods and services from households and businesses, together with increased demand for credit and a reduction in the credit spread. So both uh, the price stability schedule and the financial stability, financial stability schedule shift out to the right, as in the picture. Uh, and as I've drawn it, we move from A to B, and both policy instruments are tightened. But in other cases, it will be appropriate for the instruments to move in opposite directions. So for instance, a beneficial supply shock will usually generate disinflationary pressure requiring lower interest rates for price stability, other things equal. So the price stability schedule shifts in. But it may well also encourage increased borrowing and a compression in spreads, leading the financial stability frontier to shift out. Uh, and in the example, as I've drawn it here, you can see that monetary policy is loosened uh, with the uh, policy rate being lowered uh, at the same time as the macroprudential policy tool uh, K is tightened. Well, superficially, this would look as if the monetary and macroprudential policymakers uh, are at odds with each other. Um, and here I'm going to recall uh, a cartoon that was in the Times uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago, which sort of embodies uh, this view. As you can see, it has uh, the governor. It's not a very good likeness of him, I have to say. Uh, sitting astride a push me, pull you. Uh, with the Monetary Policy Committee uh, holding rates low, uh, but the Financial Policy Committee talking about uh, introducing uh, constraints on mortgages, mortgage rules, or whatever. Uh, what I think the analysis that I provided shows is that it may be perfectly appropriate for uh, the two instruments to move uh, in different directions from time to time. It's not symptomatic of the policies being at odds with each other. It's a rebalancing in the mix. Now, there are somewhat, uh, there are um, uh, important qualifications to this somewhat uh, Panglossian view of the ability to maintain both price stability and financial stability by assigning monetary policy to the former and macroprudential policy to the latter. Compared to the impact of changes in interest rates, we've relatively little experience of deploying macroprudential instruments. And there'll often be scope for those affected to work out ways to circumvent them, including by moving activities outside the regulatory perimeter. And as Federal Reserve Board Governor Jeremy Stein noted recently, monetary policy may be a blunt tool for addressing financial stability risks, but it does have the virtue that it gets in all of the cracks. So there may well be times when monetary policy is the only game in town uh, for guarding against incipient uh, financial stability risks. In that case, we're back in the world where monetary policymakers need to be prepared to consciously lean against the wind by deliberately undershooting their inflation target in the near term in order to reduce the likelihood of something nastier happening further down the road. Well, this thinking has now been embodied in the Chancellor's remit for the Monetary Policy Committee, which sets our objectives each year. Uh, so the remit letter uh, uh, presently notes uh, 
Uh, quote, circumstances may arise in which attempts to keep inflation at the inflation target could exacerbate the development of imbalances that the Financial Policy Committee may judge to represent a potential risk to financial stability. The Financial Policy Committee's macroprudential tools are the first line of defense against such risks, but in these circumstances, the Monetary Policy Committee may wish to allow inflation to deviate from the target temporarily. And the remit also directs the Monetary Policy Committee to have regard for the actions of the Financial Policy Committee and vice versa. Well, I open my remarks tonight by observing that my time at the bank has neatly fallen into two halves. Seven years of unparalleled macroeconomic stability have been followed by seven years characterized by financial instability and a deep recession. It was a salutary lesson for those, like me, who thought we had successfully cracked the problem of steering the economy and highlighted the need to put in place an effective prudential framework to complement monetary policy. Policy making today consequently looks a much more complex problem than it did 14 years ago. Well, in Genesis, uh, following his interpretation of Pharaoh's dream, Joseph is made the most powerful bureaucrat in Egypt, uh, Mark Carney, perhaps, uh, in which position he ensures that enough grain is hoarded during the seven years of plenty to provide sustenance during the seven years of famine that followed. That's a parable on the value of prudence. And central bankers in future would do well not to forget it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Charlie. Um, there's so much wisdom in there. I'm sure that um, there'll be lots of questions and attempts to distill the wisdom still further. But I learned uh, enormously, and it was very clear and very constructive. So thank you, Charlie. Um, we have um, just under half an hour for questions. Um, we'll take uh, three, three at a time and um, try to keep your questions as short as possible, please, so that um, uh, as many people as possible get a chance to ask. Um, I'll go up, up and down, um, top to bottom, and uh, it'd be very good if there were questions from women as well as men. Un unfortunately, macroeconomic policy uh, seems to be one of those areas of life where um, uh, males tend to, to dominate for reasons I don't Although, uh, fully I, understand. I, I, I can't resist mentioning, of course, we have two women about to join the Monetary Policy Committee. So. Yes, yes. <laughs> One of whom, Minou Shafiq, was my, my student here at, at the London School of Economics and yours in the um, 1980s and a tremendous acquisition, I should say. Um, Anyway, that remark aside, I didn't mean to deviate this early. Um, let me uh, take um, a gentleman uh, at the back with one finger pointed upwards. It is a good way of uh, attracting attention. Hello, good afternoon. Um, my name's Moya and I'm at UCL. I study mechanical engineering with finance. Um, I did um, understand the reasons why um, rates are still low in, in the UK, but I was thinking considering everything in the UK is tied to the interest rates, so with derivatives and um, house prices and mortgages, um, for any consequential increase in base interest rates, how do you intend to communicate with um, more the fund managers because they could have explosions of basic ri basis risk, um, and how would you go about that? Thank, thank you, and uh, th thank you for giving your name at, uh, affiliation at the beginning. Um, let's keep that up. Gentleman in the white shirt, just here. Hello there. I'm Hello there. 
Um, my name is Edward Donati. Um, I work at a fund managers around the corner. Um, and uh, I just have a question about one of your early charts, uh, which was about productivity in the UK. Um, would you, is it fair to say that the growth of the growth rate of productivity pre-2007 was normal? Or I suppose, to what extent did the provision of credit or excess credit fuel the rise in productivity pre-2007? And if that is the case, do you think it's possible to um, get productivity increases in a deleveraging cycle? Uh, the gentleman right at the front at upstairs, and then we'll turn, we'll turn to Charlie for first round of responses. Hi. Uh, Pete Comley, finance author. Um, a question almost picking up the first one, really, over rates remaining low in the long term. What's the longest you think they might stay low? 10 years? 20 years? 30 years? <laughs> right. Okay, well, um, the, the, the first question, which, if I understood it right, was about how we would communicate um, uh, and manage uh, raising rates. Um, mar market participants, um, and indeed uh, agents generally, obviously crave certainty. They would like to know um, exactly what's going to happen. What, the, what they love is a promise from us. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the very sensible way to run policy because the appropriate setting of interest rates must depend on what happens in the economy. And we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know what's going to happen in the future. Uh, I've been surprised enough times uh, in my um, many years forecasting um, uh, to realize that. And there's many things that we don't understand about the evolution of the economy. So the, the best that we can aspire to is to try and make people understand what determines our policy decision in the jargon, our reaction function. Uh, that's what we were trying to do in a simple way uh, with uh, the first version uh, of our guidance. The, I mean, the problem is that the, the things that we look at, uh, there's a huge range of them, and uh, the art of policy making is uh, drawing out a picture from lots of different conflicting, noisy indicators. So it's not something where you can uh, write down a simple expression that says, if this happens, then uh, something else will happen to the policy rate. But we do, we do hope by uh, trying to be as transparent as we can be about our assessment of the economy, um, how we're interpreting events and what sorts of things we're responding to, that that will give um, uh, market participants a better, uh, a better handle on what is, is likely happen to, uh, to policy rates uh, going forward. Uh, now, to leap to the, uh, the final question about how uh, long rates will remain uh, low, um, that's a difficult question uh, to answer. I mean, we, we've been uh, quite clear uh, when we talk about rates staying uh, low into the medium term. We're not talking 10, 20 years ahead. This is the sort of uh, beyond our normal forecast horizon. So you're talking about three or four years ahead. Uh, and that basically reflects the fact that we think that some of the forces which have essentially driven uh, the equilibrium level of real interest rates around the world to low levels are going to persist for some while. But one of the striking features in the years leading up to the crisis was this downward trend in real interest rates. And this had nothing to do with monetary policy, uh, except you know, perhaps in the very latter stages of it. It's reflecting real things like high Chinese net saving, um, uh, uh, similar factors. Uh, now, in the crisis it, itself, the equilibrium real interest rate will have moved down very sharply as economies are starting to recover, so it's moving uh, back up. Uh, but nevertheless, it's still at pretty depressed levels. And because we think um, uh, deleveraging by both private sector agents, banks, households, uh, and the public sector, for that matter, is going to uh, be continuing for some while, uh, we, we think that um, China is likely to be a net saver for some time. Further down the road, 
Uh, you may well find that there's reforms to uh, safety nets there and the financial system that uh, lead that to change. But at least for the next few years, it's likely to continue to be a net saver. Uh, and also the, the fact that uh, the, if you're looking at risky uh, in interest rates on risky assets, um, the risk premium will probably artificially compress pre-crisis, people underestimating risk. Um, and although they appear to be quite low at the moment, I, I wouldn't have expected that to be sustained uh, in the future. And that in itself will put downward pressure on the safe rate of interest. So you've got these sorts of forces which are uh, together pushing down on the, uh, what the economists refer to as the, the neutral uh, real rate of interest. And we would expect that, you know, gradually probably to um, uh, edge up, but uh, as I say, for, for the sort of time frame three to five years ahead, uh, we would expect it to be materially lower than it was in the, the pre-crisis uh, period. Uh, the second question about uh, productivity growth and was the pre-crisis productivity performance normal uh, I think the first thing to say is, I mean, there are potentially measurement issues here. Um, uh, it, it's, uh, particular, it's conceptually difficult to measure uh, value added in financial services, insurance, things like that. On top of that, the Office for National Statistics have to use all sorts of uh, proxy variables and, uh, and the like. Um, and there are good reasons to think that maybe uh, some of the growth that we saw in the pre-crisis period, of which there was quite a lot within the financial sector, uh, might have been overstating what was going on. However, you can pretty easily get a handle on uh, how big such a mismeasurement might be by simply assuming, say, that the rate of growth in productivity in the financial sector was the same as in the rest of the service sector, or even zero. And uh, if you recall my productivity chart, that showed the level of productivity today is about 17% below uh, that continuation of its pre-crisis trend. And you can only explain one or two percentage points uh, of that in terms of these measurement issues. Uh, there's some other factors that we can quantify, such as North Sea oil running off. And that, again, is about a percentage point. Uh, so there's quite a few of these things. You can get a little bit of the story, but you're still left with a pretty big chunk. Uh, now, we think uh, a, a good part of that chunk that's left is associated with the impact of the financial crisis because uh, one of the features of the financial crisis tends to be that banks uh, um, become loath to foreclose on uh, loans because of the uh, um, non-performing loans because of the uh, potential impact on their, uh, their balance sheets. There's a tendency to keep zombie companies alive, if you like. Uh, and also because of the um, uh, difficulty of getting funding, they may also be less inclined to extend loans to new businesses that have uh, good investment prospects. So you get an impairment in the allocation of capital. Uh, and what one would hope is as the economy picks up, the the sort of process of creative destruction that is a normal part of capitalism will start operating a bit better. Uh, and that's one of the reasons for expecting some of that investment shortfall to be made up. Uh, another reason why productivity has been depressed is investment uh, has been depressed for the last few years. That means capital accumulation uh, has been lower. Also, uh, there may be less work, uh, learning by doing, uh, the labor force and so forth. Uh, you know, th th there's lots of potential stories that we have out there, but what we don't really have uh, is a complete story uh, where we can quantify each of the, the various elements. But in answer to your question, is part of it associated with the uh, financial crisis and the aftermath? Almost certainly yes. Uh, a gentleman with the beard right in the back row. Oh, sorry, I meant the one next to you who's been even We've more also patient. Got the beard. There's more than one beard in the back row, but don't worry. Uh, it's Richard Edgar, the uh, Hi. first guy. <laughs> you, you, will, you will get there. Hi, uh, Rahul Snakina, MLP. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation and giving us another framework on with, which, with which one I think can look at the decisions you guys face on monetary policy as well as financial stability. 
which leads me to my question, and it's actually two pronged. The first one, the first part, is more about does do these given the, car, the these current macroprudential tools which you have identified and talked about. Do you think that macroprudential policy now gives the MPC uh, more time to keep rates easy for longer? And I guess that leads me to the next question, which is... It, it, I think one question, Sasufi, yeah. Uh, okay, and the, 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 the other bearded gentleman in the back row. <laughs> Thank you. Richard Edgar from ITV News. Um, you explained how macroprudential policy and monetary policy can move in apparently different directions and not be contradictory. Um, but I'm wondering, is it possible for the um, FPC to impose uh, macroprudential um, uh, policies on, that act on the housing market, say, at the same time as help to buy is stimulating that self-same market? And uh, lady uh, upstairs. Um, I was interested in your questions on the unwinding of QE um, and your comment that you wouldn't do that until um, interest rates are high enough to give a bit of slack um, should things start to go a bit pear shape. Um, but slightly contradictory with your comments later that actually the um, equilibrium rate of interest is going to be much lower for longer. Um, and I wonder what level of interest rates is high enough to start raising QE and um, when you think we might get there. Right. Um, okay. The the f first two questions, which uh, are, are slightly uh, related. Um, firstly, does having effective macroprudential instruments uh, essentially give more room for no for manoeuvre with monetary policy? The answer is yes. Uh, if you only have one instrument and you compare uh, and you're concerned about. Uh, price stability and financial stability. You're, you're having to try and hit some mix of them. Uh, and essentially, the, if you like, the, uh, the Bill White argument, the leaning against the wind argument, is an argument that applies when you've really just got one uh, instrument. Um, financial instability can create a very nasty volatility and output further down the road. So it makes sense to um, accept more volatility and output inflation in the, the short run. If you've got an effective macroprudential instrument that can uh, allow you uh, to head off the financial imbalances that are growing, leaving you with a monetary policy instrument to be targeted at the, uh, the inflation and output objectives. Um, uh, so uh, effective application of, uh, of macroprudential tools, in principle, does leave monetary policy uh, free to, uh, to be accommodating longer to support the recovery. Um, then the second question is sort of, again, about combinations of instruments, but here it's um, both in the, uh, uh, the sphere of uh, uh, a particular uh, credit asset market. Um, so does it make sense to have the FPC imposing macroprudential tools at the same time as some other policy, and you talk about help to buy, uh, stimulating? Um, the one thing I would say with, with help to buy, pe people should keep it uh, in perspective. Um, uh, it it's accounts for a relatively small number uh, of mortgages. Uh, if you look at London where uh, the house price growth has been concentrated. Um, it's not stoking the uh, the upper end of the uh, the market. The, the the limit is not um, uh, sufficiently high enough for that. And there's relatively few transactions taking place uh, for mortgages above three hundred thousand. Um, help to buy is is a scheme which is really about improving access. That's uh, was the the purpose of it. Um, and uh, if you've got an access objective, uh, but there are other tools that can deal with imbalances or risks that might build up in the banking sector, it may be perfectly sensible to have the two policies running together. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, the Chancellor has made it clear to us that if we thought help to buy was helping stoke up um, uh, dangerous um, 
uh, financial imbalances, uh, financial stability risks further down the road, um, he will expect us uh, to say so. We've been asked to review the terms on an annual basis and also uh, say whether the uh, scheme itself should continue at the end of its uh, uh, initial three-year period. Um, and I'm sure the, the committee, if it uh, felt there were risks out there, it wouldn't feel constrained to have to wait until the annual anniversary. It would, uh, it would say so before then. Um, <coughs> unwinding QE, uh, uh, at what point um, w would uh, we say that bank rate is back to a high enough level uh, that it would be safe to start the program of asset purchases? Um, I, mean, the, I mean, the reason for wanting to be up there is basically we want to get back to a world where the marginal instrument of policy is, is bank rate. Uh, and you wouldn't want to start a program of asset sales and then have to suddenly stop it, put it into reverse, things like that. You'd say, you know, we're going to uh, sell off 50 billion over the next six months or whatever it might be. Uh, so uh, there will be a judgment uh, uh, to be made at what point uh, does the committee think that there's enough of a route margin for manoeuvre um, that uh, it's safe enough to, to start a program of asset sales and still have um, some, some scope to stimulate policy if growth slowed. Uh, and of course, you can always cancel a, a sales program if you want to, so that's always there. Um, and um, you know, th that will be a judgment that uh, the committee will have to take in the future. I mean, it's not something we need to uh, decide, uh, obviously, at this point. I won't be around be part of the committee that makes that uh, decision. But if you think about how much interest rates, bank rate varied in the pre-crisis period, it was uh, about plus or minus two percentage points around its average. So um, that's the sort of normal uh, cyclical variation. Um, and maybe uh, you want something of that order, maybe not quite as big as that. Um, so, uh, but as I say, my, uh, uh, my colleagues will take that decision in due course. Thank you, Charlie. A uh, gentleman in the front row, um, and then lady second row, and then Danny. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mr. Bean. Thank you for, for your uh, presentation. Well document, well presented. Uh, Mr. Bean, uh, I've, here, I've lived here some, some while in this country, and I feel uh, uh, that the approach to the economy in this country has been farcical. It, it is, it's years and years gone, been bust and boom, boom and bust, and there's never been any, any, any planning. When you compare and contrast uh, the wasted uh, oil resources from North Sea and contrast that with what happened to in uh, Norway, when we, when we talk about uh, developing countries, we quite conveniently, we omit to mention what happens in Germany, how it's booming, or what's happening in Japan, where it can sustain a deficit for a long time. I call the economy in this country a casino economy, where you can make uh, uh, money just could like you, could the, you get uh, your just question, please, at, the, at the whim. We, uh, in this country, now are dependent on looted money from the Middle East, from looted money from uh, Russia, looted money from other uh, countries. Uh, we have the Qataris, the Kuwaitis, the Dubai sustaining our economy. Uh, please, sir, do you, do you have a question? Yeah, the question is, what controls have we got against these, uh, the, these uh, individuals who are bringing looted money without the consent of their own people bringing into this country? And finally, please, would you tell me, uh, a question, answer me a question, which is the conservatives keep on uh, throwing at the La Labour Party as to the amount of gold bullion which was sold. Uh, nobody's been able to assess how much was sold and whether it's made any difference to the economy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, lady behind. Cheryl Schoenhart Bailey, the LSC. Um, in thinking about the uh, recent discussions in the Treasury Committee with regard to uh, central bank transparency, I was just wondering if you might share your views as to both the 
wisdom and the viability of publishing the verbatim transcripts from the Monetary Policy Committee meetings and possibly also the FPC meetings with, with certainly a, a, some sort of lag, time lag. Thank you, Danny. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Danny Kwa, London School of Economics. Charlie, um, someone once said of the crisis, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And you have shown us splendidly how the Bank of England and yourself, monetary policy, have adjusted to the crisis, the things that we have learned from there. It is very impressive. But in your comments about what the financial markets are still doing, the complacency, the response to messages that you are giving, I wonder if you are also telling us that the private sector has actually not yet taken the right lessons from the crisis. But either way, what do you consider to be the most important lesson the private sector, financial markets, uh, banks in general, have taken from this crisis? Thank you. Okay. Um, the, the, the first intervention, which touched on uh, a lot of issues, um, I mean, uh, one general point, uh, I should make uh, is to stress that um, monetary policies and financial stability policies are just a tiny part of the whole range of policies, both economic and non-economic, that uh, uh, the sort of public authorities uh, take. Um, and um, you know, what, what one certainly can't expect monetary policy uh, to address real problems uh, of the uh, economy. Um, for instance, the housing market, uh, the governor at the, um, the weekend was being very clear, uh, we can't build a, a single extra house if the fundamental problem is not enough houses relative to the number of households uh, that, or the, the demand for houses. The only way can we solve that is by building more houses. Um, uh, you, you, you uh, touched on issues about um, uh, flows of money, particularly sort of looted money. I mean, insofar as um, the uh, government um, identifies um, flows of money that it wants to restrict, uh, one of the things that the Bank of England is tasked with is actually policing uh, those. So, for instance, there were sanctions on Iran, uh, and the sanctions on Russia, on some Russian individuals at the moment, uh, we will have to be involved, we're involved in actually uh, policing those, but we're not obviously the agency that decides to do that. That has to be in the realm of um, uh, the political uh, powers. Uh, transcripts uh, and all of that. Um, uh, I, I have to say I'm not a, personally a, a huge enthusiast uh, for transcripts uh, in general um, because of uh, the potential worry that it actually changes the nature of the discussion that you have. Our monetary policy committee meetings, particularly on the Wednesday afternoon, is very free-flowing um, with people interrupting each other. And you know, if, you li if you listen to a recording, it, it would actually be quite difficult to follow because you wouldn't know who was speaking and who was interjecting. And, the conversation bounces around from one topic to another. And that's when we're discussing uh, the data and what's going on in the economy and, and so forth. Um, and uh, the concern is that that sort of free-flowing discussion, if you know it's going to be transcribed, uh, you, uh, you end up coming with pre-prepared statements. And there's some evidence um, from what happened in the Federal Reserve, which you, of course, have documented uh, that um, uh, I think it's the, isn't it the average intervention in the uh, the 70s is about 80 words uh, per person. Um, by the time we're into the Greenspan years and transcripts were being published, it was 250 words, uh, and that's basically because uh, people were coming with pre-prepared statements that they read out. You don't really get a, a discussion. Uh, and actually, I think one of the big values uh, of the, having a committee like the MPC is having a, a genuine discussion about what's going on and learning from your colleagues. 
Um, and it should be said that actually the MPC is only one meeting in what's a sequence of meetings. We have forecast meetings and things like that. And actually ha having the transcript of just one bit of a, a sequence may not always be terribly fruitful. But, you know, we are often referring to things that we've discussed in some other meeting, um, and somebody reading a transcript would say, oh, what does this mean? Um, there may be a bit more scope um, for the when we actually take the decision, because that's a bit more uh, structured, the way we conduct ourselves on the Thursday morning, and people there usually have come prepared with something that brings together their, their various views. Um, importantly, I think, I mean, transcripts, they're not really part of anything to do with transparency. There may be something to do with accountability, uh, and you know, there may be of interest to historians in the future, but when people talk about transparency, um, for me that's something about explaining current policy decisions, and it, so it's real time, it needs to be immediate. Um, and um, uh, I, I certainly uh, would not think it would be valuable putting out, uh, if you like, a real-time transcript. I mean, we spend a lot of time in our minutes, and they're designed to try and give people a coherent uh, picture of what uh, we concluded at the meeting, what was discussed, uh, whereas to, to try and distill that from uh, a six-hour recording where the conversation bounces around all over the place, uh, I'm not sure it would be terribly, uh, uh, terribly fruitful. Anyway, I mean, we have... Uh, uh, invited Kevin Walsh, uh, who used to be on the, uh, uh, used to be a Fed governor, uh, to give us an indep independent view on this, and he'll be reporting later on uh, this year. And uh, no doubt the committee and the bank will decide what to do in the light of that. Uh, finally, Danny's uh, question: sort of never waste a crisis, and have the has the private sector taking the right lessons. I mean, the, 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 the biggest single lesson to take from the crisis is much nastier things can happen than you can envisage. Uh, people underestimate uh, the severity of tail events and the likelihood that they will happen. And when they do happen, the interconnections between different bits of the economy are, are often um, unravel in ways that you didn't expect. Um, before the financial crisis, so we used to have a discussions occasionally in the MPC uh, called, called My Nightmare, uh, where we used to try and figure out how things would go badly wrong. And the, each month, somebody would uh, take it, w would describe a scenario where things unravel badly. And in the pre-crisis period, most of them hinged about, around inflation expectations becoming de anchored not surprisingly, oil price shocks, things like that. Um, if somebody had uh, come up with a scenario that actually happened uh, from middle of 2007 onwards, I think the rest of the committee would probably have said, you're bonkers, that could never have happened. But viewed with hindsight, of course, what happened in the financial crisis all looks perfectly logical and, and sequential. So, I mean, there is, I think there is a real problem of the, the human mind envisaging how uh, these uh, bad events can, can unfold. And, th and that, in some ways, is the, uh, the single most important lesson because it means b uh, bankers and financial institutions shouldn't trust their models and, uh, and so forth. Uh, on top of that, it points to the value of holding uh, lots of buffer or reserves against uh, bad events, having a, for banks having a, a significant... Uh, uh, margin of capital that can absorb losses and potentially uh, other instruments that can be bailed in to renew that capital if necessary and so forth. So there, that's the biggest single uh, uh, issue, I would say. Th thank you, Charlie. Um, I'm very sorry that we'll have to draw it to an end now. I, I'm sorry to all of you who... <coughs> Um, have been trying to ask questions, but it's uh, one minute to eight, and um, we have to finish uh, exactly now. Um, but I hope you'll join me in thanking Charlie, not only for a great talk, but for answering the questions.